Welcome to the Incredibly Human podcast. Uh, today I've got Jason with me. Um, Jason is a respiratory therapist manager, correct? Yeah. Um, and before we get going into everything, he wants to open up with a little disclosure. Yeah. And then I have a little disclosure, but go ahead. Yeah. Um, I appreciate y'all inviting me to do this and really yeah. look forward to just kind of talking, talking right. through it all. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, a little background behind me and, and I think, you know, my view on everything may be a little bit different just because of the role I'm in now. And then, um, my military experience and things like that, I've had a little bit different life experiences than some folks mm-hmm. that, you know, may give a different perspective on things mm-hmm. that, you know, that really are my own individual take on stuff. So, right. um, I'm, ex- I'm, I'm excited. I appreciate y'all. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So basically this is not the, any reflection of, of, of my employer, anybody else, right. Baylor, Scott and White. This is, this is from me, from a heart and right. just, you know, what, what we're going through. Right. Yeah. And ultimately that's kind of the point of these. My disclosure is real quick. We, we have a divider that you can't see. We wore our mask before setting up. We know that, um, this probably isn't the most foolproof thing, but we wanted to take the precaution as we're talking about COVID. Um, it's not foolproof, but you know, we're attempting to do what's safe. Right. So anyways, that's our two little disclosures. So going forward, Jason, you are a respiratory therapist manager, correct? Mm-hmm. Um, you're an army vet, yep. uh, father of three, yep. and apparently a legitimate barbecue cook. <laughs> I, I'm just a bar, uh, a backyard barbecue guy. Right, you know? but you've got a lot of followers. I mean, I got a thing. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah a, you know, I'm good at it, but whatever. Yeah, you know, I, modest. Um, yeah, it's fun. It's it's uh, it's my therapy. Like right, my, yeah. my my page is called Meat Therapy because mm-hmm. getting out there and and taking a raw piece of meat and creating something really delicious out of it yeah. is is therapeutic for me. And then being able to share that, uh, you know, with my family. Um, pre-COVID with fan, friends and family mm-hmm. and, and just seeing the joy that that brought them was, you know, that just does something to you or right. it does for me. Right. And just kind of see that joy. So yeah, yeah, cool. I, I got, it's my thing. Yeah. Cool. Well, <laughs> good. And then last but not least, you're Santa Claus on the side. Yeah. That's my retirement plan. Right. I have, uh, I've decided to, uh, stop my 401k. I'm mm-hmm. dumping it all into the suit right now. Right. Uh, you know, maybe a legit sled. I don't know where this thing's going to yeah, go, but you just never know. Yeah. You know, uh, you know, probably another 30 years you'll see me in the malls. Right. That's what I'm going <laughs> for. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, I say that because that's how I actually met you. Um, Callie, I came up there to shoot toys for tots and you were Santa Claus number one. Yeah. <laughs> so anyways, uh, Callie afterwards, you know, I was asking who everybody was that I met and everything. And, um, she, uh, she said, you know, that's Jason. And she was like, yeah, he's a really good guy, you know? <laughs> um, so for me, and then when I found out you're in the management side of this, you know, there's a whole aspect of, of what you're dealing with, um, that a lot of people don't really know. Right. Um, you, you know, you know a little bit more than, you know, what other people are going through. Um, so, uh, when she said that though, you know, Jason's a really good guy and it, it just made me think that, you know, leadership matters. Yeah, it really, really does. Yeah. Um, character matters, you know, how we respond to things, um, in our society, uh, our coaches, our teachers, our, you know, our, our governors, our politicians, our media, our journalists, you know, everything that we do, um, when leadership, if there's good leadership against steer a ship, you know, um, and, and your character and who you are as a person really matters. So, uh, when she said that, I thought, you know, maybe we need to kind of talk about that and a, a little bit when it comes to a pandemic. I guess first, uh, let's talk a little bit about your background. You know, you're a military guy. What division did you serve? I was in the army. Okay. Um, yeah, I was in for almost five years. Mm-hmm. Um, got out a little prematurely. Um, and so I'm a disabled veteran as well. Um, and then, um, you know, father of three and I, I got out really wasn't sure what I was going to do. And my youngest son, who's now 19 was like, well, I don't have to go to college because your mom didn't go to college. So two weeks later, I signed up for college. Mm. 
And I uh, wasn't sure what I was going to do. All I know is, well, you're not going to be able to use that excuse. And uh, um, then I started kind of looking around. And my oldest son, who's 21, is a ex-24-week 21, 24 micropremie. So he was like a pound, six ounces when he was born. Wow. A lot of respiratory issues uh, in the beginning. Um, now just kind of some asthma and stuff. And um, so whenever the I was going to Temple College, which is right outside of Killeen, mm-hmm. um, where I was stationed, at Fort Hood and saw they had a restory program and uh I, I was like well let's go healthcare so I went uh to the restory thing to the info session went to the nursing info session um went back to the restory info session and there was a couple of factors that I was like you know what I think I could get into a NICU faster um if I was a restory therapist and Felt like I'd be able to give back more in that setting Mm -hmm. faster. Just being a parent, living through it, and then middle, Mm -hmm. how the medicine side to talk about it. Um, And then the other factor was, you know, I really felt like I would be better from the diaphragm up. Mm -hmm. I did not think I'd be able to handle all the things that, you know, our nurses have to handle from the diaphragm down. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. So, that's kind of, that's a little bit of my adventure. Right, right. So, you were influenced and you were kind of steered into a direction of why you went to respiratory. Yeah. Yeah. Just kind of got out, military, trying to figure things out Mm -hmm. and looking at, you know, I guess my boys drove me, you Mm -hmm. know, in the direction that uh, I went to. Right. So, yeah. Cool. Um, So, uh, a lot of people don't even know what a respiratory therapist does. Yeah. Um, they're kind of, uh, I didn't even know pre COVID, mm-hmm. you know, uh, we talk a lot about nurses and, uh, because I'm married to a nurse and everything, yeah. but, uh, what does a respiratory therapist do exactly? Um, the, the simplest way I put it is we save lives, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, um, and you'll, you'll see me going around the hospital kind of beating on my chest a little bit like, Hey, how's your day? It's like, we save lives. Mm-hmm. You know, what do y'all, what did y'all do today? We save lives, mm-hmm. you know? Um, we do everything from um, breathing treatments, you know, the simplest things of breathing treatments for our asthmatics, our COPD ears, uh, to be able to just open up some airways, to um, incentive spirometers to make sure the lungs are expanded, all the way up to intubations, mm-hmm. um, putting a breathing tube down someone so that we can place them on uh, mechanical ventilation, which is like a life support machine mm-hmm. is what people consider that. Um, arterial line placement. Um, we also extubate people. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes to sometimes to uh, get them, you know, they're they're prepared, they're ready to wing, uh, get them back on the track home to their family. Mm-hmm. Other times we are extubating, which you know, removing removing the breathing tube. Um, to send them on to their heavenly home, mm-hmm. um, you know, and that's, that's part of the course. So mm-hmm. it's, it's a lot. Um, a lot of people, um, just think, Oh, a respiratory tech or just oxygen or breathing treatments. So there's, there's a lot more into it and just the calculations and, and different things, um, is, is we save lives. Right. That's what we do. Right. We yeah. try real hard anyway. Yeah. So. yeah. <laughs> well, this is a, you know, it's a respiratory virus. Yeah. Um, so, you know, before I knew anything about what, you know, respiratory theorists do, and they're also referred to as RT. So mm-hmm. we say RT and that's, yeah. that's what it is. Um, but, uh, but beforehand, you know, uh, I think I, uh, talking to Callie or looking it up or something, um, she said that, you know, in, in terms of how many RTs there are in, uh, in comparison to how many nurses in a hospital, yeah. the number is much lower. There's a lot less respiratory therapists compared to nurses. Yeah. Um, and that's because typically, you know, you're, you're solely treating, um, respiratory issues. Right. Well, now that you have a virus that's, you know, primarily affecting people in the respiratory system, mm-hmm. the demand on RTs is a lot higher, right? It's skyrocketed. Yeah. It really has. Um, and not just for, you know, our facility, for our system, for, really the national healthcare system as a whole. Mm-hmm. Um, this virus has brought a big, you know, something that we've known as respiratory therapists for a long time. That was an issue is there was just a lack thereof. Um, because of the staffing uh, models and matrices and things mm-hmm. like that, that 
just wouldn't allow for that many um, RTs to be staffed in a facility. Mm-hmm. Um, and now seeing seeing this and and how involved a respiratory therapist is has brought to light. You know, all right, this is this ain't just a community issue. This ain't just or isn't just a state issue. This is a national issue. Mm-hmm. This is a global issue that, right. you know what, we don't have enough respiratory therapists for this. And, um, you know, you're seeing more and more stories of that, um, throughout our nation. Um, uh, you know, from New York to all the really super hot spots, especially early on. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, now Texas. So, right. Yeah. And it's one of those things where you just don't know until you, you, you get to that point. Right. You know, you don't know how critical somebody's support is or that that medication is or you know that therapy is until you get to the point where everybody needs it right and now it's like yeah um and just here now like you know we didn't realize how much you guys do until now you know there we're all in it everybody you know is this patient population that feels like sometimes and so Mm -hmm. um you know to and we've always had such a great relationship with nursing, you know, it's one team, one fight. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but now seeing them more on the respiratory side and seeing exactly what we're doing, being in it patient after patient after patient, um, you know, it's getting more noticed like, wow, y'all really are kind of stretched thin, aren't you? Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, we, we are. So, right. So give us a minute. We'll get there to you. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah. Um, well going on top of that building on top of that, um, you're somebody who kind of sits in between upper management and the people who are working the floors Mm -hmm. and their patient care, you know, so you've got to be that middle person that is advocating for your staff, Mm -hmm. but also listening to what expectations are, you know, how, how do you, how do you handle that responsibility? It's tough. You still have, you, you have patient care. The patient comes first. Um, and that's, you know, so my heart will always say that the other side is that there are things that we have to meet to be able to continue caring for that patient population or, or our patients, our community, everything else. Um, so it's really recognizing where we're at and seeing, seeing the, seeing the faces of your team and, not only seeing it when they come in and just they're hurting, they're in pain, but not only that, like getting out there with them and being elbow to elbow and, um, you know, getting down and dirty and experiencing it and you come back in like, all right, we got to do something. And that's where it takes just that, that piece to go to your leadership and have that communication with them. It's like, Hey, this is where we're at. Mm-hmm. We're, we're hurting, mm-hmm. we're hurting bad. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, talk, you know, potential safety and things like that. And it starts, you know, opening up eyes and they start assisting and helping and things like that. Right. So it's, it's a fine line mm-hmm. of this side of it, um, versus, which is the business side. The bus- yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, healthcare is a business. Mm-hmm. It really is. Mm-hmm. It's the business of healing. Mm-hmm. Um, but it is a business. Right. And so merging the two and I feel like I probably don't all, I sometimes I'm too transparent to a fault to the team. And so, um, and I think it's cause I'm out there with them in it and I feel that pain cause I'm experiencing that pain as well. And so I'm like, look guys, we can't because of this end. Right. I'm sorry, but this is what we got right now. Mm-hmm. And we're going to, we're going to figure it out. We're a team. We're going to do this as a team. Mm-hmm. You know, we're going to talk with our, our nursing leaders. Hey, this is where we're at. This is what we can do. Mm-hmm. Let's work together, come out with it. And right. it's, it's more, there's this side, but making this side work with it. Right. And so, yeah, no, I mean, you, it's, it's not just healthcare. That's across the board. Yeah. You know, um, a lot of restaurants had to make cuts mm-hmm. um, because they weren't getting the support, small businesses. Um, you know, you're going to see that across the board. There's always going to be business and there's also going to be, you know, the needs of, of your people. Yeah. Um, 
I'm a true believer that they go hand in hand. Oh yeah. Um, without your your staff and and the support and everything, your business fails. If right. they're not happy, your business fails. Right. Um, but there, it is that's a tough that's a tough line to to tread. It is. Um, you know, for from our restaurant team, they they've been doing it. You know, we have a great core, and we brought in some really awesome new folks that are really gelling in. We're just one big family, mm-hmm. you know, and a team. So, you know, you throughout this whole thing, you'll never hear me say staff or employee. We are a team. We would not be getting through this if we were not a team. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, they, they've they all embraced this. And from the military aspect and military front uh, terms, they've embraced the suck mm-hmm. because we're in the middle of the suck. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I, our last team meeting, we came together. It was during Restorative Care Week and kind of talked to them of – you know, I was open and candid and honest, you know, prior to this, I always kind of drew a line between civilian and military people. Like, well, civilians, you don't, you know, you're been in 142 degree weather with 80 pounds of extra gear, right. getting shot at or, mm-hmm. you know, all this. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a little different, but, you know, this is, this is a war right. that we're in. Mm-hmm. And um, I think in our, some of our initial communication with each other, you know, it's like, yeah, our warriors, you mm-hmm. know, these, these are, they are warriors. Now they are warriors in my eyes, not just us, but everybody in healthcare now mm-hmm. that is at the bedside and, and providing care, um, with these patients. It's, it's an invisible enemy, mm-hmm. but it is a war, right? you know, and, and that's kind of where we're at and they're teams, warriors, they're right. true warriors. Well, that's that, you know, that was a question I was going to ask pretty soon was, um, you know, a lot of our healthcare workers, I mean, you have a, you have a military background, so you guys were probably pushed to your limit Mm -hmm. in training. Mm -hmm. Um, you were prepared for a crisis. You were, you know, you're really, you're, you, you've got to be prepared for that. Um, our nurses, uh, RTs, techs, all of them, they didn't have that kind of background. They didn't get that training. You know, they're, they're studying a lot of books. Um, they don't even really get hands on until they get into the hospital mm-hmm. um, and they're they're shadowing and, and actually working in patient care. Um, but that was that was going to be my question is how would you compare this to a crisis situation having a military background? Um, and you, you kind of said it, you know, it's 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 pretty serious. Yeah. You know, um, our a lot of our uh, health care, they're starting to deal with PTSD and anxiety mm-hmm. and depression and they're getting pushed to their limit. So, um, you know, how do you, somebody who, who's had that background, how do you empathize with people who don't come from that, that background? You know, um, how do you lead to where you, you're, uh, you're trying to, I mean, it, it, it's difficult because you, you've been there, you know what it's like, they haven't. Um, but you also want to lead in, in a way that, that empathizes with the fact that they have it. Yeah. Um, and, and that's one of the big transitions I've made throughout this process, um, especially on the empathizing part and just being empathetic. Um, you know, whenever I was transitioning out and first good bit, it was not an easy transition for me into civilian life at all. Like mm-hmm. it was tough. And just having those candid conversations with team members now and things like that, um, they're having a lot of those same thoughts and feelings that I had during that process. And so I'm like, all right, I know, I know what you're feeling. Mm -hmm. Like it's a different experience at the time, but the feelings still are, are, are kind of the same there. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, I had a lot of resources, uh, to help me through that, to develop some coping skills and things like that. And so to be able to just kind of share some things, that have helped me along the way with it and be there for them has been, has been good. Um, but I think, you know, early on and recognizing that this is unprecedented times, Mm -hmm. especially in healthcare that we've never seen. This Mm -hmm. is a global pandemic, global respiratory pandemic and just, you know, day in and day out and, um, the wear and tear seeing that on them reminds me a lot of a military deployment, especially mm-hmm. in a hot zone. And so I think it helped me quickly transition into, all right, how do we, what do we, 
how do we do this? What do we do? Mm-hmm. And, you know, I don't know how I've always been placed in leadership positions or what seem whatever. I don't know. Other than when it gets like that, like I'm, I'm going to get out there with you. We're going mm-hmm. to get through this together as much as possible. You mm-hmm. know, like I said, we're, we're going to, uh, we're going to grind it out together. Right. You know, I don't want to say like, follow me and I'll right. lead you to it. But right. I guess that's kind of my aspect of it is, mm-hmm. all right, I'm never going to ask you to do anything I would never do. Watch. Let mm-hmm. me show you. You know mm-hmm. what? You work four days this week. You're dog tired. Mm-hmm. Let's get you some rest. Mm-hmm. I'm going to work six days, you mm-hmm. know? And so I guess that's it. Just through action, showing that, you know what? I understand that you're tired. You know what? I'm going to come in and work today and go into staffing and not call somebody in so they can have that day off mm-hmm. if I can. Or, you know, I'm going to work till six o'clock. I'm going to go home. And because I got, I, someone's going to pick up for a few hours, I'm going to come back in at 1230 in the morning and work the rest of that shift out and then into the next shift. Mm-hmm. Um, so I guess just having that mindset of just lacing up your boots and grinding on mm-hmm. and, and, showing that action, hopefully it picks up right. from them to say, all right, we can do this. Right. If this old man can still do it, you know, mm-hmm. we can get in there and still do it. Right. And, you know, I don't, I, I hope that they see that, I guess a little bit, just that, you know, I care and what, what we're doing, mm-hmm. um, to try and, and make it as less tough as possible. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's, it's going to be tough no matter what. Right. Um, and then just show them I care. You know, mm-hmm. I, there's days I, I feel defeated Yeah, a lot of days, mm-hmm. you know, and sitting down with them and, and I, you know, if they can see it on my, on, if I can see it on their face, I know they can see it on my face. I don't mm-hmm. have a poker face. I, they know like, like, Oh, his, his ears are red. Mm-hmm. Y'all, let's, let's give him a minute. You know, I, right, I do right. not have a poker face at right. all. Unfortunately, I wish I did. Mm-hmm. Um, I probably do a lot better in my, my poker games and tournaments, right. but I don't. Um, well, I think there's, you know, when I think of good leadership, there's a few qualities that I think are extremely important. Um, one of those is, and this is coming from somebody who's, I have very little uh, leadership experience. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, back when I was 19, maybe, um, so it, for me, it's more of an observer of what I've seen. Uh, but I think, you know, what qualifies to be a great leader is somebody who, who doesn't tread too much into a negative mindset, but also not too much into a positive mindset because it can be equally toxic. Yeah. You know, if you're just overly um, positive and you're sugarcoating everything and you're just glazing over what people are experiencing and you're not mm-hmm. empathizing, um, I don't think it translates, you know, uh, they don't, they don't, uh, people don't buy into that. Right. Um, and then same thing with negativity, obviously, you know, you've got to be hopeful. So I think it's a balance of reading the room and Mm -hmm. and understanding that people respond to different leadership. Um, but you, uh, it, it, you have to be, you have to balance that, but also be honest. Mm -hmm. Honesty is just one of the best gifts that we can give people. Um, and whenever our leadership doesn't, uh, demonstrate kind of an, how they're actually feeling and what you're feeling. You know, you talked about being transparent and how it might not be, you know, always best. Um, you know, I, I think sometimes that transparency, you know, give, give them a little more credit that maybe if they see that you're struggling, um, it helps them feel like, okay, I don't have to carry the world on my shoulders. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, if, if they feel like you're just, plowing through and you're carrying everything, then, you know, they feel like if they're not doing that, they're failing, yeah. you know, and I think with a lot of our healthcare workers, you know, they're, they're kind of caught in between that they want to be in there and they want to be heroes and they want to be able to take this on, but they're also just getting worn out. They're getting beat to death, yeah. you know, so we have to be able to empathize and be honest and, um, just admit like, Hey, this sucks. Yeah. It sucks. We're not, we're not necessarily winning. Mm -mm. Um, but we're, we're like you said, we're in this together. Yeah. And I, you know, I think coming from you having a, you know, a military background would help other people outside of healthcare understand like how serious this is. Yeah. Um, 
because you know, a lot of people don't even try to try to say, you know, what military people go through if they've never experienced. Like yeah. I would never, I would never try to brush off what war is like or right. anything. But some people will kind of do that with healthcare because it's not war, mm-hmm. even though what y'all are seeing and experiencing is just gruesome. It's tough. It's yeah. Um, and I, I've, you know, I've seen that. I've I've tried so hard to kind of get off social media mm-hmm. for the most part. I mean, I I can't on my Instagram, but there's right, you know right. it's a different community that I'm in on that one. But mm-hmm. you know, on some of the other platforms and just seeing the stuff that's out there and. Mm-hmm. Like you just want so bad to just like, you have no idea. Mm -hmm. Like stop reading the bathroom wall for your news and go find a nurse and talk to them. That's Mm -hmm. in a COVID unit. Go talk to a tech, go talk to respiratory therapists, go, go talk to anybody that's working within the walls of your community, um, facility hospital and get the real story, Mm -hmm. you know, and nobody wants to do that. Um, and it hurts a little bit, you know, yeah. and you see just a, a, a lot of people still like, oh, this is fake. This is a conspiracy and mm-hmm. this and that. And, you know, full disclaimer, you know, I'm, I'm conservative. Yeah. I am, you know, um, and no matter, and I don't care if you're this or that or whatever, mm-hmm. you know, I just want you to be a good human. And right. to still think that this is just a joke and mm-hmm. a hoax is absurd Mm -hmm. like it blows my mind that that's even still a thought for people um because the pain that i feel from my team Mm -hmm. day in and day out and you know you try really hard to leave that at the door so you know you always try to work really hard to have that work-life balance Mm -hmm. and when you leave out that door you know, and you lay your head down at the end of the day and you're like, all right, was I able to give my team 120%? Mm-hmm. It should give you rest and peace of mind. Mm-hmm. But even at the 120% mm-hmm. level, you're very uneasy. You're unsettled. You're, you hurt because of the pain that the, everyone's going through, mm-hmm. you know, caring for these patients. You know, it's just very physically and mentally taxing mm-hmm. on everybody. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I'd, and I talk a lot about my team, you know, my team here, my team, but it, it's encompassing. Like, you know, I'll round through and check on other disciplines and just make sure they're okay. You mm-hmm. know, it, it's everybody's the team. And so, you know, was, was I able to do everything I could for respiratory? Was I able to do, do everything I could for that? the patients that I saw that day was able to, was I as helpful as I could have been for our nursing team or our leadership team, Mm -hmm. or, you know, there's just a lot of weight that goes on there. And, and just, I keep going back to pain. I feel like I'm being redundant, but that's what it is. Mm -hmm. And that's where I feel like a lot of community, community members and societies missing the point. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, it's like, man, if you could just come spend about 15 minutes with us. Oh, I know. Yeah. That's what we were talking about. Our first podcast was just, if you, if people saw or heard, if, if I could tell the stories, um, which we can't, yeah, yeah, unfortunately, (laughs) but if we could tell them yeah, and I'm not, you know, I'm not a nurse or anything. And this is just what I'm, you know, I could be an exposed to being married to a nurse. Mm -hmm. Um, it, I mean, it, it'll humble you real quick. Oh yeah. Um, and, and so, you know, uh, I mean, that was another question was just feeling the pressure, you know, as you know, Callie, she, she, she feels it because again, like you said, you want, you want to be there for these patients and Mm -hmm. you want to help them and you don't want what's happening to happen. Mm -hmm. Um, but you being in that leadership role, you're also feeling the pressure to make sure that, yeah, you feel like you're leading by example, mm-hmm. you know, and I think that can be a very taxing job. And I, I don't think, and I, again, as an observer, I think it's very easy to be critical of our leadership. Mm-hmm. You know, I, like I said, leadership matters, character matters, um, how we respond, how we act. Um, that goes, that goes on both sides, whether you're leading or following, if you're an employer or an employee or CEO or janitor, all of that matters. Um, but I think, you know, we can be very critical we can be very judgmental. Um, sometimes I think it's warranted 
Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, there's people who are just dropping the ball yeah. in terms of leadership. Um, and then sometimes I think we can expect a lot more, uh, or maybe too much. And then you carry that and that weighs on you. Yeah. Um, that becomes exhausting. And then when you start to slip and crack, um, you, everybody has a breaking point. Yeah. At some point yeah. you're, you're going to break. Mm -hmm. Um, and if you start to slip and crack as a leader, you know, that'll affect your team. Yeah. And so I just think that, you know, that's why it's so important to be just honest, but, uh, you know, communicate as well as you possibly can. Mm -hmm. Make sure you're listening, make sure you're advocating for everybody. Um, but you know, it, it goes such a long way, but it's so hard to do that in crisis mode. Yeah. I, I couldn't even imagine. Yeah, it is, you know, one of the big things, you you know, we call it a hold on a communication, um, especially in the beginning of this, like every four hours something was changing mm -hmm. and making, or how you cannot communicate every four hours worth of change effectively. Mm -hmm. Like you just can't. Otherwise, we're on just the longest Zoom call ever. Right. Or WebEx. Um, and so how, how to take that information and make sure it's getting to, everyone and disseminating down and, um, so that it's not missed and, and everyone's aware and can perform, you know, and it still continues today. It, it's so many different levels and layers of communication and, you know, all right, did I get this out there? Oh, we have this new thing. All right. Was I able to get this out effectively? Were people able to, excuse me, understand it? Um, and then whenever you get some, you know, some, Hey, we didn't know about this. And you look back, you're like, Oh mm -hmm. guys, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I missed it. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it's a lot, you know, just on that aspect. Right. And then, um, you know, we don't just go out with our bare hands. We have so much equipment, especially from a restaurant. Same, you know, nursing does too, but we have a lot of stuff that we, own and house that we're responsible for ordering ourselves. And so if I miss an order or, you know, miss it, or we can't get something in and we don't pivot to something else, then we could, it affects patient care. Mm -hmm. We can't provide this to a patient care that could ultimately need it. Right. And so, you know, there's a lot of time spent trying to do that as well. Get, get the supplies we need to be able to continue caring mm -hmm. for our patients. Um, Right. So, I mean, it's already a difficult job, but then when you add in just a constant, Oh yeah. Uh, I mean, it's, it's just not ending. It's getting worse. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, we, there's a certain device we use and all of a sudden we're out and I forgot to, I forgot to let the team, Hey, we're out of this. We're trying to pivot towards this. I was mm -hmm. two days late on that communication until someone was like, Hey, what's up? And I was like, yeah, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. You know, and I feel like I'm apologizing a lot. Yeah, I don't know what to do. Right. Just other yeah. than keep grinding it out. Hey, right. you know, we're all human in this. We're, mm -hmm. We all make mistakes. Uh, you know, y'all are trying, we're trying, we're getting this together. Um, the good thing is, is, like, I feel like I have a good relationship with the team that they can hold me accountable and I can hold them accountable. Mm -hmm. And we have that relationship, which is good. Well, so. I think as long as there's that forgiveness, you know, oh, if yeah. they know. If they know for sure that it was an honest, you know, mm -hmm. we're all human, mm -hmm. you know, um, if they know that and, and we can sympathize with that and empathize with it. Um, but you know, let's, and I think that's, that's actually another point I wanted to make uh, about communication is whenever you, you know, cause I see a lot, especially with politics and, and stuff like that, especially this year, you know, when we, when we celebrate our leaders who aren't willing to say, you know, I screwed up, mm -hmm. you know, I messed up. Um, if, if we enable them or I just don't, I don't think that reflects well in terms right. of our leadership. Um, even, even as human beings and just, just you know, as people, uh, owning up when you make a mistake is, you know, that's a big deal. Oh, yeah. Um, or if you don't have the right answer saying, I don't know, yeah. um, you know, all of that I think is extremely valuable, um, in terms of, and, and with this pandemic, it's been a lot of, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. And we're trying to figure things out. Yeah. Um, and a lot of people just don't realize that, yeah. you know, again, they look to the medical community to have, to solve this issue. Mm -hmm. Um, and if it's not happening well, then it's like, you know, your guys are dropping the ball and it just, you know, I, there's so much to this. Mm 
um, that, that just makes it, you know, layer after layer, it makes it very, very difficult. Um, but you know, let's dive into COVID specifically. Okay. Um, what can you say about COVID the virus, uh, and how it is actually affecting the lungs? It sucks. <laughs> it, you know, it, uh, it does all, it's something we never really experienced for or seen, you know, some, depending on the viral load, things like that. Um, we can, from oxygenation ventilation standpoint. So some, some people, uh, are okay and it's all right. And it's just a little bit of oxygen on some and some do have to have, you know, have to be intubated and, uh, mechanically ventilated. Um, you know, we see the, the lungs get really stiff. Mm. And so we, we talk about fibrotic lungs, things like that. It's, they harden up and come a lot of them really hard, high pressures. Um, you know, just, it's like ventilating rocks sometimes right, right. rocks don't move. Right. Um, so, uh, you know, doing different strategies for that to not only be able to do, um, to effectively ventilate and oxygenate, but also we want to protect the lungs as well. Um, so using different modes and strategies for that, um, to make sure we're, we're doing the best we can. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the secretion level, um, on some of these patients are just, are crazy. And, and so you have to keep those, uh, I guess. When you say secretion, what do you mean? So mucus within the lungs. Oh, okay. Yeah. So uh, mucus bit boogers, whatever you want to call it down right. in your lungs. Right. Um, get really dry. They can really dry out and, you know, lungs can become, we call it plugged off. So, you know, you're, you have your branches of your airways going down, mucus sits in there. You try to get it out or it sits there. They dry out. They come just hard, right. like concrete. Okay. You know, there's, um, you can look it up, uh, on YouTube and stuff or the internet. You can see cast of secretions come out and, it looks like the airways. That's how hard. Those oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, I've seen that yeah. before. Yeah. So, um, that's a bad day. Yeah. Um, so making sure, you know, keeping them humidified and, and those lungs hydrated and, uh, things like that. Um, so a lot of people don't understand that when they hear that, you know, um, people are having trouble breathing mm-hmm. and they're not getting oxygen. Like if you put one of those oxygen, what are they called? The SPO2 monitors. Yeah. 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 If they put that on and they see that their oxygen level is getting low and that's Mm -hmm. what's typically happening with a lot of these patients. Um, what is, is it that specifically that's causing people to have low oxygen levels or what's causing people not to breathe as well? A lot of just the inflammation side, things like that. Mm -hmm. So you get really inflamed. Um, uh, you long as you get the fluid in there, excuse me, can't get it back out. So it essentially impairs gas exchange. So your lungs, uh, you have gas that comes across the membranes and, um, helps for, to take good blood, turn into bad blood and oxygen, things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, and it becomes impaired with this. So kind of gets blocked, I guess, uh, the best way to say it. And, and so it all just kind of fails at that point. And so, um, you may have a segment up here on top of the lung that looks good and your lower lungs are not so good. So you may be only getting some decent gas exchange up here, um, or over here. And so it's, it's very mismatched. So ventilation perfusion mismatch or BQ mismatch is really what's going on. So, so that just, that causes people to not, their lungs aren't working properly. Oxygen's not being, pump to the to the, your tissue right. essentially yeah so you're just not getting that proper gas exchange coming across to properly oxygenate it um so it just drops everything on you gotcha so yeah a, a lot of what i've read um is is inflammation is is kind of the key thing mm-hmm. um and a lot of i think a lot of people don't understand that when we when we talk about like cures mm-hmm. uh or therapeutics um, I think people are still thinking the virus is still at play mm-hmm. um, when really it's the damage has already kind of been done. Yeah. It's the immune response that's causing even more damage. Yeah. So the people that are ending up in the hospital and on ventilators and stuff, it's not necessarily COVID still uh, specifically. It's, it's that 
things are have gotten so damaged and the inflammation is so bad things aren't working properly right. and now you start having like you said stiff lungs or hard lungs and yeah, blocked the, airways and yeah. vessels and yeah, it's the immune response to the virus being, you know, your body's a, a well oiled machine and tries to fight anything for and into it. And this is the response your body gives mm-hmm. to try to protect itself. Right. So it just, it, it does a little too much. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And then the, you know, there, it gets way deeper, like on the cellular level from the, the different storms that happen within. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we're still, we're still trying to understand it, mm-hmm. you know, and all the effects of it and, uh, and long-term effects, mm-hmm. you know, especially, um, you know, sicker patients and stuff like that. And, and what is it going to be? Hey, all right, you're going home. Um, what's the next few months? What's the next year going to look like? Because, right. you know, you, you, you may you're st- talking pretty bad damage to yeah, you can. You know, tissue. And yeah. I mean, your, yeah. your body can only take so much of that before it starts to you know, I mean, it, we've talked about that too, me and Kylie, just a little bit as long-term effects of, of you know, even if you pull through, and I don't want to be a, you know, obviously this is already down and yeah, we don't want to be even more down if you mm-hmm. recover from this, but um, there's just a lot more to, you know, the effects of this and what's yeah. going on in the body. But yeah. um, so when people think of like therapeutics and the virus and stuff, uh, really uh, we're, we're trying to help the inflammation process or mm-hmm. we're trying to prevent too much inflammation so the the lungs don't have too much of an issue yeah inflammation secretion removal all those things go in there and then to get so if you have too much secretions in there that can impair Mm -hmm. everything so making sure we're getting that out getting the swelling down uh within the lungs um just to help with that impairment, the, the gas exchange impairment that's mm-hmm. happening. Once you do that, then you can start seeing, you know, your little pulse ox that's on your fin- your finger probe, your UT finger. You know, you can start seeing that. Um, we do arterial blood gases, which gives you the true picture of what's going on in there from a, a, a CO2 and oxygenation standpoint. Um, and, and with this patient population, it's really the oxygen. So you get your PO2 and... Um, you know, see what we're really doing and we can see kind of where we're really at with PF ratios and things like that. So, yeah. Yeah. A lot of stuff that I don't entirely comprehend. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Well, uh, yeah. So I guess the point that I'm trying to think of is, is, you know, people think that it's pretty, they want to simplify it and Mm -hmm. it's really complex. Oh yeah. Um, I've actually read people who think that, um, you know, uh, they, they had a family member whose oxygen level was going low. Mm-hmm. They were still fine, but their oxygen, they're having trouble breathing. They go to the hospital. Um, next thing you know, they end up on oxygen or mm-hmm. they're getting a little bit of oxygen. It doesn't progress. Next thing you know, they end up on a ventilator. Mm-hmm. Things get even worse. Uh, and then they either don't come off the ventilator. Um, they pass, mm-hmm. but a lot of people are under the assumption that when they go in and they get on the ventilator, it weakens the lungs. It makes it worse. Mm-hmm. Um, if you could speak to that a little bit and what's actually happening and you know, I, from what I understand is, is it's progressing, it's getting worse. But if somebody doesn't get the oxygen that they need, if they don't go to the hospital, if they see their oxygen's low, but they, they're kind of afraid that they're going to get put on a ventilator. Mm-hmm. What happens if you wait too long? Uh, wait too long, your oxygen will drop. Uh, it's not into your t- tissues. You'll go into cardiac arrest, plain and simple. You'll, or, you'll code, you'll, Mm -hmm. you'll die. Right. Um, uh, yeah. So the oxygen one keys to life. Right. If you're not oxygenating well, it's not getting to all your tissues, your heart, your brain, things like that. It'll just eventually stop working. So let's say somebody comes in and they get oxygen put on them Mm -hmm. and you all get that level up. Mm -hmm. When do they end up on a ventilator? You know, it, it, it depends on the individual. Um, look at a lot of different things. Just work of breathing. We'll look at um, FIO2 requirements, uh, respiratory support. So uh, we have different things that we can use before getting to the ventilator. And we try to use it beforehand. Mm-hmm. You know, you have your regular nasal cannula. You have kind of a, a higher level nasal cannula or oximizer. Um, then we have a heated high flow 
uh, nasal cannula system. Well, what is all of that and what does it do? So they're all oxygen delivery devices. Okay. Um, the, the big one that we have used the most of is heated high flow nasal cannula where you can deliver high flows, high FO twos. Um, the flow kind of helps to overcome, help with some of the work in the breathing while delivering that high FO two or, or oxygen level, um, that the patient requires. Um, and it's heated humidified, uh, as well. So, so it's supposed to help break up all the stuff. It can, it can help with, um, just hydrating the, the secretions in the lungs, uh, trying to help with motility, things like that. Yeah. Um, so we'll, from our standpoint, we'll take a look and like, all right, we're going to go on, let's just say a standard two liter nasal cannula and start trending up. All right, we're going up. We'll go ahead and initiate a high flow nasal cannula sooner than later. Uh, just because we've gotten better at recognizing, all right, we're trending up. Um, and then we'll try and get someone to prone. Um, proning has been a big asset where you get almost like an army crawl, right. you know, on your belly or on your sides of tolerate um, and go that route. Um, and then, you know, if the patient can't tolerate that, we're still going up on FIO2 and just the work and breathing, you know, is high 40s or 50s consistently. You can't keep that respiratory rate up all day, every day, you're going to get tired to the point where you're going to force us to, to intubate and, and put you on mechanical ventilation. So, um, recognize that in a patient like, all right, we're, we don't want to get to that point. Let's go ahead and add this therapeutic intervention in now, mm -hmm. um, and go with the intubation and mechanical And y'all are using a lot of the therapeutics that have been toted as like cure-alls and, and, like the remdesivir and you know all these other things, y'all use that type of stuff, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. So it's it's not like people aren't using them or hospitals aren't using them. Mm -mm. No, uh, we you know use it and you know we have great physicians that are I, I don't know where they find the time to continue to read studies, but they're right. you know on top of it and all right, this is kind of the new thing. Let's read a little bit more into it. Let's try go that route so we we you know we we have the things right to that. i just i've i've heard people you know and you've probably seen it too like a lot of the the theories and stuff but mm -hmm. you know i even read uh or we had heard somebody say that um hospitals um are intentionally putting people on ventilators because they make more money doing it <laughs> yeah yeah i remember seeing when that came out i was like you all right we're going we're going to shut this one down right now mm -hmm. i'm just going to log out before i get myself in trouble mm -hmm. um no uh that is that that's ridiculous um um you know i don't deal with the billing side of things or anything like that right from and that aspect but this no like we to a fault like we will we will do everything in our power to keep from having to put you on mechanical ventilation. Um, you know, when, once someone has to go on mechanical ventilation, we do everything we can, um, proning things like that, but it's not ideal. So you and I, we, we live and breathe in a negative pressure world. Mm -hmm. Whenever you go mechanical ventilation, that's a positive pressure world. So the body automatically doesn't like it, like it right off the bat because it's completely something or something completely different. Mm -hmm. And then, um, like, I don't remember the numbers, but after three days of mechanical ventilation, just muscle atrophy starts just plummeting. Mm -hmm. So we are weakening you. The longer we're, we have you on a ventilator, the weaker you become, the harder it's going to be to get you off. And then once we can get you off, it's going to be harder to get you built back up and strength, you know, strong enough to go on and carry on about excuse me, the, you know, your normal life activities that you once were. Right. So no, we're not, we're, it doesn't, it's not even financially, it wouldn't even make sense to, no, no. Cause I mean, you're weakening the patient. You're weakening the patient. Um, you know, I think, all right, let's put my manager hat on mm -hmm. the, the amount it takes to care for a, a ventilated mechanical, you know, a, a ventilated COVID patient from a 
resource standpoint, from your nursing, from your tech, from your respiratory, from all disciplines alone, just the manpower it takes to care for these patients is unbelievable. Mm -hmm. So if we're ventilating everybody and it's pulling all of our resources to them, then it makes it even harder to care for the other patients. Right. So no, it is not. And then how we were kind of, how we opened it up, you, you're short on RTs. We're short on nurses. Mm -hmm. If, if you have ventilated patients, they become what, like one to one, one nurse two, something like that. Um, less, less nurses, uh, or you're, 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 yeah, less nurses to patients. Mm -hmm. Um, you are, you're, you're needing more people. And like mm -hmm. you said, you're needing more resources. So yeah, it financially, it doesn't seem like it's making, making any sense. Yeah to put people on a ventilator, but also the, the moral and, and just the kind of disrespect yeah. that you would have for healthcare workers. Yeah. Because putting them on these things, you know, it's, it's horrifying. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's not like, Oh, let's just put a tube down somebody's throat and be on our way. Yeah. It's, it's horrifying. It's dramatic. It's, um, and then like you said, it does, it weakens them. Um, and a lot of times it, it it's very difficult to come off. Yeah. We're, we're, we're in the ministry of healing. We are, our business is to heal, to help others. Mm -hmm. And to think that we're, you know, healthcare systems as a whole is doing this just to make a buck is just insane. Right. right. You would have to, everybody who's a nurse or a tech or a, you know, RT yeah. or a doctor, they'd all have to be, you know, evil, right. Downright evil, you know? Right. Um, and, yeah, it, it, it floors me some of the stuff that comes out. Right. And some of, like, how do people think of some of this stuff? Yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't get it. You know, I'm, I'm sure there are different payment things behind in the background mm -hmm. that is twelve steps above my pay grade. Right. But nobody's coming down the floor and saying, "Hey, put these people in." No, no, no. Hey, if it's coming down, hey, how are we going to get these people extubated? How, right. You know where are we at, you know, and, and that's from our top leadership down, you know, coming through like, all right, how, how can we help these people get off the ventilator? It's not, let's keep them on this thing for 30 days. And you right. Know, and nothing. financially too, you know, it reminds me of waiting tables. You're going to make more money if you, you flip the tables. Yeah. Um, if you get people in and out of the restaurant, mm -hmm. you're going to make more money. Oh yeah. Same thing with the hospital. If yeah. you get people healthy quicker and you get them on their way, you can get another patient in there. Yeah. Otherwise all these patients are going to another hospital. Yep. So financially it would make more sense not to put people on a ventilator. Yeah. Your length of stay, you know, right. and, and I'm sure as a whole, you know, United States healthcare system is seeing length of stays increasing, mm -hmm. which then does a disservice to the community you're trying to serve because it makes it tougher because you got more patients in there that we can't move out. When those financial bills start racking up, it's more likely that people aren't going to pay it. Yeah. Um, if it's out, outrageous statements, you're not going to pay that. But if it's something that's more manageable, mm -hmm. the odds are you're more likely or an insurance company is more likely to, to help a little bit more. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So, uh, you know, when we, we heard stuff like that, it was just, it was kind of heartbreaking because it's yeah. like, you know, to, to expect everybody. And the reality is, you know, every, every line of work, every, anywhere where there's going to be money made, you're going to have people who aren't doing it right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're going to have some sort of corruption. You're going to have some sort of level of lack of integrity. Yeah. Um, you know, there's, there's, you know, we said this last time on our other podcast, there's bad nurses, mm -hmm. there's bad doctors, there's people out there that are, you know, this is, you know, a financial stable job. Mm -hmm. Um, there's crooked ones out there who do really, really poor, poor, terrible things. Um, but, yeah, uh, and, and it's the same thing with what, like, if you look at, uh, policing, you know, uh, there's bad cops out there, mm -hmm. bad officers, but to throw everybody under this one category, you know, I, and I, I get frustrated too. You know, we all kind of get frustrated with the government, but to say every government, you know, employee is, is just out there to stick it to you. And, you know, it's just, it's, it's a little bit ridiculous, you oh, know? Yeah. Um, but I, th we tend to do that. We tend to do that with all these different entities. Um, we just kind of label them and assume the worst. Uh, when in reality, there's a lot of really good people, oh, yeah. um, being married to a nurse. I know Callie, I know her heart. I know what she, what she's going through, mm -hmm. 
But now going through this, I'm seeing it through her friends. Mm -hmm. You know, she's on the phone after work. She's talking to them. You know, they're crying after work. They're uh, the other night she came home and she was she was shook. I mean, yeah. absolutely shook. And for people to, to kind of turn this into some sort of, you know, there, there's some some bigger hand here, mm -hmm. some sort of corrupt thing going on to financially make it off of all these people. Yeah. Um, but there are there are those misconceptions. There's these, you know, people just don't trust our healthcare. You know, mm -hmm. they, you know, and, and you know it. There, there's levels to that that I understand, but there's also, you know, right now it's, it's, uh, it's serious. You know, mm -hmm. it's a serious thing. So, um, yeah, let's in your leadership role and in kind of being, uh, you know, kind of in that middle management area. How do you prevent your your staff from from burning out? I don't know. Hmm. I don't know. Yeah, that's very, I, um, you know, this is, this is probably the one I, I wrestle with the most, um, at night or leaving the door day or in the middle of the day or any time of the day, um, other than being there and, trying to give them the tools they need mm -hmm. when they're not there. I'm trying to, you know, give them a couple of days off and just recognizing that they're to that point and mm -hmm. not even like not putting them in that, Hey, we had a call in text message. Nope, not today. You know, mm -hmm. I'll pull that shift instead, mm -hmm. you know, and I guess that's where it's at is trying to give back a little bit um my time which you know is just a crazy amount of hours for the last 10 months but trying to give more where I can when I can and and just asking them hey are you okay mm -hmm. and listening when mm -hmm. they're not um you know <laughs> being in healthcare and being a, a guy in healthcare uh you know you're, you're grossly outnumbered and and so, you know, men and women, we, our feelings, we, we do everything with our feelings differently. And so that's been humbling to sit there and, you know, just listen from a, a you know, a different aspect and, and try and figure out right, how do I care for this individual's mental health right now? Um, because it's not good, you know, mm -hmm. it's. It, it's broken. It's burnt out. And so, um, talking, you know, listening and just talking through with it and we're not saying anything. And sometimes just being that ear mm -hmm. and having that vent session without any kind of repercussions or anything like that, you know, has, I feel like has helped a lot of people. Um, at least that's how I feel. I don't know if it has or not, right. you know, it, our system has uh, resources, you know, hey, we have this resource. Do you want some more information? How can I help you mm -hmm. um, navigate through that um, if you need to or empathizing with them? And yeah, it sucks, guys. Mm -hmm. Like this was a crappy day. Right. But we navigated it together. Um, Do you feel like this has helped you evolve at all as a human being? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. I always in my, so our self evals, um, every year. So there's something like, all right, where do you feel like your weakness is at? And every year, like this is <laughs> probably the worst thing for a healthcare professional to say is I am traditionally have not been an empathetic person. I didn't really understand what empathy was. I don't know if that's just from life raising or mm -hmm. military, just getting beat out, you know, what right. I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and I would, I would be, you know, I'm honest to a fault. Like I got to work on developing my empathy mm -hmm. and whenever I'm sitting there and listening and, and, the pain and the hurt and feeling that and then not being able to leave 
that at the door when I come home and I bring it home and my, I love my wife. She's a, she's a nurse too. Um, and, and, and I can't leave it at the door and I bring it home and it affects us. You know, I think it's evolved. I'm still trying to figure out how to handle that, mm-hmm. the empathetic side and the feelings and the emotions. Cause I feel like I kind of carry it. Um, even if I don't always show it. Um, but it's helped me develop that. And I think it's, it's helped me connect on deeper levels with the team. Uh, I know I mean, kind of like you were saying, you know, same here going through stuff that I've, that we've gone through, you know, Callie, she's a very, she's emotional. So typically for her, when she's hitting that point, she, she'll kind of break down, mm-hmm. you know, she'll, she'll kind of let it out. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, to me being more, uh, you know, a guy I've, I've, yeah. Um, we tend to, you know, maybe act out a little bit more aggressively. Yeah. We get more vocal. Yeah. Um, we're not, we're not, we, our emotions come out differently, right. you know, almost in a different wavelength. Um, so over the years for me personally, I've, I've, I can find, I have found that more emotional side mm-hmm. and just allowing it to be, don't, don't let it come out in an aggressive state, but mm-hmm. let it come out in more of a, uh, just a calmer, uh, natural, more peaceful way. Yeah. So. Yeah. That, that's been, you know. I kind of revert to military. There's no emotion in the military. It's all, right, yeah. it's all just, you know, you go through it. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, there's still a lot of that in me, but I have seen, been able to tone it down at times to where I can connect better and like, all right, this is not the appropriate time to rally the troops and, mm-hmm. and, you know, run into the, uh, run into the fire it's time to take a step back and let's let's see where we're at and, right. and listen and yeah, just listen do you think and this is completely off off this topic i mean it's relevant but you know i'm not a military guy mm-hmm. i've never had i don't really have any family you know maybe extended family or something but um i didn't come up from that background but um do you feel like maybe that mentality of just kind of pushing through it you know, kind of this hardness of, cause you have to, in those situations, you can't be a real mm-hmm. soft person. And when you're in a, you know, when you're in the suck, as you were saying, mm-hmm. do you feel like, um, that kind of comes back and haunts you a little bit when it comes to, uh, like these types of situations or civilian life or empathizing with your wife and being a dad and you know, all this stuff. Oh yeah. Yeah. You know, cause you know, like right now there are times that I have to like, all right, let's think about what you're about to say or do because in my mind, I'm like, well, I don't understand why we can't push through this assignment. I don't understand why we had to break this assignment up this way. Like you should be able to push through this and make it happen. Like you kind of just fire, Mm -hmm. make it happen. Why, why couldn't we do this? Mm -hmm. And that's that, that push through drive, drink water, drive on aspect, mm-hmm. you know, you just, you embrace it and you go, you get it done. Um, so learning to tone that down and think about it from a different side and a different view, um, you know, from patient care of, um, you know what, because they may not be able to give the care to each individual patient that they, that patient deserved because that's how, that's why I was broke up. Okay. All right. You know, mm-hmm. learning to look at it through a different looking glass. Mm-hmm. Um, same, you know, with my family, like, you know, I have two older, older boys and, um, uh, ball boy, you know, 1921. Now I have this little girl mm-hmm. who's four mm-hmm. and I'll, I'll admit it right here. Now that that kid has shown me a side of tenderness that honestly did not believe existed within me mm-hmm. and it's still developing because I still, you know, she's still dis- disciplined and everything else, even though she's daddy's little girl. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think she's kind of beating me down a little bit and making me kind of soft at times. Yeah. So, um, they'll do that, man. I, mean, I don't know, but no, they, <laughs> she, so I can, all right, I can tell you probably in the last 20 years, five times that tears have fallen from these eyes. 
One of them was about two months ago. It wasn't. We, she, she has long, beautiful hair and it was time for a haircut. I've been fighting this moment from, from day, whatever time my wife was like, all right, we got to get a haircut. Mm -hmm. No, no, she can when she's 18, you know, let her make that adult decision. (laughs) So the tangles and all that was getting a little too much. So it came time to finally get the haircut. Mm -hmm. Man, if it didn't turn me into a little ball and baby, (laughs) I, I was, I, to this day, I'm still confused over those emotions. Mm-hmm. I have not been able to process that to right. figure it out. We sit down in this little salon right down here on the square mm-hmm. as they're cutting hair, masked up. I don't have I don't have my you know glasses on mm-hmm. or anything, but you could have sworn they were fogging up mm-hmm. to the point it was like I have to excuse myself and walk around the corner and get a beer. Or right. I'll come find me when you're done. Yeah, my little girl is getting a haircut. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, look me down. And so that, that you know, I, I think I tell that little story to take it to this moment now of, like, oh, wow. Like, all right, you hard ass, you can, you have emotion in you. You can feel. Mm-hmm. How do we translate that to now? And just in the last two months, I feel like I've seen a difference in myself towards my team. And I think uh, over the last two months, I've really seen that empathy come in and understand it about myself and how to handle it, I guess, or, or how to just understand it. You know, I'm still working through it. Um, right. You know, sympathy is there for sure, um, but the empathy. And, and it's, it's crazy how just a little moment like that, you can translate it into you and your team. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that's where the whole, you know what, I'm just going to sit here and listen and care through listening. Mm -hmm. And it's helped me to understand that pain more and, and feel their pain more. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we haven't even really talked about the patients themselves and what you experience with seeing people. Yeah. Um, (laughs) so I think. Unfortunately, and I'm sure, you know, I don't know, Callie's developed this or I know other healthcare professionals have, you know, in military develop it. You, I call it an emotional light switch where you turn it off and you numb yourself. Mm-hmm. And it's not because you don't care. Mm-hmm. It's because you, you care a lot. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you, you just care Mm -hmm. and you try and process, process those, uh, those feelings. And and so you try to shut it down to where like, all right, I care but we're not going to let that affect me because we got to take care of the next person. Right. And then, you know, you can come home and drink some whiskey or whatever. Right. So (laughs) cope with it in some way. Yeah. Yeah. As long as it's not too. Yeah. You know, and I say that, um, as you know, I know you see all these memes, especially throughout this of the alcohol intake and things like that and understand coping, but there are other ways, you know, I, I'm not going to preach, you know, cause I, I enjoy a good, I enjoy a good whiskey. Right. I, I, I enjoy a good bourbon. I, mm-hmm. I enjoy a good drink. Um, but you know, earlier you were talking about how not being too energetic and not too low with that even mm-hmm. kill. Well, mm-hmm. cognitive thought reprocessing, you know, you got to change that. Mm-hmm. that mindset of where you're at and where you are. Cause, and, and I've had to do that with myself. And that was something I've learned through a lot of, um, things I went through after the military just to help with some stuff. Mm-hmm. And so <clears throat> I've, I've been fortunate now to recognize whenever I'm going one way or the other mm-hmm. and to be able to do that, uh, thought reprocessing to bring it, and flip it back down. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I know that's probably not a skill set a lot of people may have. Mm-hmm. Um, 
but the resources are out there to help with it. And right. so, you know, doing that to bring it back down and, and, and not just like, I'll come home and like, man, I need a drink. No, you know, it's come home. It's like, you know, I think I want a good scotch. Right. Or, you know, yeah, whatever. I know. I, but, we but all it have is, our, our avenues. Yeah. The and, vices and, yeah. and right now everything, you know, you can't blame anybody for anything. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's like the wild west out there. Right. Um, but you know, everything's good in moderation. Right. So. Yeah. No, for sure. Uh, you know, I kind of been thinking about how nurses, you know, nurses who maybe were good at one point and then they, they kind of went south, and I wonder if some of that was the toll of it. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, being able to, you know, that's something that, you know, Callie and I haven't figured out is how do you turn that off? How do you, you know, she carries every single patient mm-hmm. um, really heavily. Mm-hmm. And it to me, it just says a lot about who she is as a person. Oh, yeah. um, but also, how do you how do you continue to have that love and passion for people and healing but take care of yourself, you know, in, in the same way. Yeah. Self-care yeah. is huge right now, especially amongst our, our healthcare, uh, workers, um, and, and trying to figure out what that is, you know, um, and I think, you know, it's individually based. What is it, what is it for you that's going to help? you relax, recharge those batteries because of the mental toll that it does take on you. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, is it sitting here and talking things out? Mm -hmm. Is it talking with your loved one, your spouse? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, like for me, my wife is in healthcare, so she understands, she sees it. She's in, she's not, you know, she's in labor and delivery. So they're a little bit different. Um, aspect, but she still understands. So I have that avenue as well, Mm -hmm. you know, talk to, so, you know, people getting it out, not bottling it up and, and, you know, the bottling up piece can really, that's what will eat you away. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's just from experience. Right. That's where, you know, trying to be vocal about it, talk about it, get it out and then go because you bottle it up, you know, eventually you become a firecracker in your hand and you ain't got a hand no more. So, right. Um, figuring, you know, everyone's working a lot. Everyone's tired, right? You, you got a day off on a stretch of six or seven or whatever it may mm-hmm. be. What do you need to do on that day to take care of yourself? Mm-hmm. A lot of times it's laundry and taking care of family and things like that. But all right, is it taking 15 minutes for yourself that morning to mm-hmm. have a quiet cup of coffee? I don't know. You know, everyone trying to find that one thing that, brings a little bit of peace. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I can even imagine cause I've never experienced anything remotely like this. And, you know, we, we talk about leadership and we talk about character and, you know, I'm, uh, you know, I, there's so many things that I have personally in terms of flaws and issues. Mm-hmm. And so it's, it's always easier to, to judge what other people are, are doing, how are they responding? You know, what role they have. It's very easy to kind of sit back and, and analyze it and stuff. But deep down inside, we're all, we're all human beings. Yeah. You know, we're all experiencing this. It's not easy for anybody. Um, but I do think, you know, we want to, if, if we can handle it, you know, our response, um, how, who we are as human beings and how we carry ourselves, you know, it, it can make a huge difference in how this is all going to go down. Oh, yeah. Cause again, it's an invisible enemy. So if we're, if we're supportive of one another, if we take it serious, you know, um, if we, we respect what it is and not turn it into some sort of political thing or, or, you know, try to steer some sort of, uh, misinformation or anything like that, but to, to see like, Hey, we're human beings. We're going through this. Let's get through this together. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, you know, uh, try to get through the other side and, and, and do it in, in some sort of peaceful way. Yeah. You know, that's the other thing is how do you, how do you, get through it. But, um, well, you know, I think we're, we're pretty much towards the end of this. Uh, I really appreciate it. Um, one thing though, I do want to add to kind of this, uh, two, two last questions. Um, what reflecting on your life, you know, you've been through a lot and you've experienced a lot. 
Um, what do you want people to say about you whenever you pass? That he was a good man. You know, he, yeah, that he was a good man. There's a lot of things that, you know, we all have our demons, mm-hmm. our skeletons. You try to, to rot all that stuff. And at the end of the day that you're viewed for the person you are and that it just play simple, simple mm-hmm. put. Right. He was a good man. That's it. Yeah. No. Yeah. Uh, what do you, what do you think it means to be human? Man, holy hell, (laughs) what does it mean to be human? Man, just part of a vast family. You know, we're all, we're all here to, to love and care for one another. And that gets lost a lot. And if that was the priority, I think humans, all of humanity, we would be incredible. Mm -hmm. We're not now. We're far, far from it. Mm -hmm. So I think to be human is, is to love and care for one another. And to see it as a vast community. Yeah. Cool. Well, I really appreciate you being here. Yeah. Um, good talk. Yeah. Uh, I empathize with what you're going through as a leader in the middle of all this. I think that's a very tough, tough position to be in. Um, but you guys are doing a lot of incredible things. And, um, yeah, we're fortunate to have you. I appreciate you. it. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for being here. Yeah. Thank you all. Cool.